We were teasing Emma a little bit earlier. Am I connected here? Yeah. We were teasing Emma a little bit earlier because she's a mom of young kids. I can walk up behind her and I can start dancing and Emma wouldn't even notice it. <laughs> All right? Because she's got young kids. She's a mom. you got to stay focused even when there's chaos. We're, we are in a new series called Stepping Stones. We think about stepping stones. Stepping stones, we understand that. That's a path that's been laid out for us. It gives us direction. It get, gets us over obstacles. We know that somebody wants us to go in this direction. And hope, hopefully, at the end of it, there's something worth seeing. It's like we have stepping stones to faith. We're actually going back to our study in Matthew. Matthew's a guy who was personally trained by Jesus. So Jesus put a lot of investment into him. And then Matthew pulled together an account called the gospel. And in this where we're at now, he's going to kind of give us some stepping stones along the path that we need to take in our relationship with Jesus Christ in order to follow him. So we're going to start that this morning. And in the course of this morning, I'm going to present what I believe is the most important question of your life. I'm going to talk a little bit about politics, and I'm going to talk about why I think the church is the hope of the world. But to do all of that, I really feel like I need to pray. So God, I just want to thank you for this opportunity to be here this morning. Lord, oh God, it's so good to be in this room. In the midst of our worship this morning, I was just impacted, Lord, how these words are like a confession of my heart. And Lord, I need to keep coming back to that confession. As I walk through highlands and lowlands, as I walk through dark places and valleys, God, I got to keep reminding myself of that commitment. And Lord, I need to keep reminding myself of the commitment you made to me. Because really, it's your commitment to me that gives me the strength to navigate those dark times. And Lord, then you bring me up onto the highlands. And I get the beautiful vista and the joy because you and your commitment have led me there. So God, this morning, I want to give myself to you. I want you to use me. I want you to speak through me. I want this moment to be yours. I want your Holy Spirit to touch every single person in this room, to fill this space, God, with hope. Meet us where we're at today. And break open our hearts to hear what you have to say to us. And be filled with joy, I pray. Amen. So going back in our story of Matthew. And this is going to hit something now. Where we're at in Matthew's gospel is kind of a turning point. Things are going to get real serious with Jesus and those who are following him. And it kind of begins right around this spot. Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, and he asked his disciples, So, who do people say the Son of Man is? It's an interesting question to lay before them. They've been following Jesus for a while now. They've seen some pretty tremendous things. They've seen some miracles. They've seen him feed large groups of people. They've seen him terrorize demons. They've seen him walk on water. They've seen him challenge religious leaders. They've heard him kind of redefine some of their rituals. It's been an incredible experience. Large crowds following him and chaos sometimes that ensues around Jesus. And Jesus stops and he asks them this question. Who do people say the Son of Man is? Well, they reply. Well, some say John the Baptist, and others say Elijah, still others, Jeremiah, one of the prophets. That doesn't mean a lot to us because we're separated from 2,000 years where that statement would have had some meaning to them. But you know what he's saying? <clears throat> the people, his followers are saying to him at this point, it's like, well, some people say you're John the Baptist, a, a significant religious leader who just lived, and somehow they're honestly thinking John died, was killed, and he's kind of like come back in you. You're kind of like channeling John the Baptist. Real crazy thing to say. Others say that you're like Jeremiah, one of our great prophets. He was a guy who stood up. He had a strong voice. He spoke to people, convicted them how they wandered away from God, gave them hope. And man, we need that now. We feel kind of lost in our world, and we need some direction, and we need some hope. And we think, you know what, the things you say, you could be Jeremiah. Another one said, well... Maybe Elijah, because Elijah was a significant figure to them. And what they're really saying is, is, maybe we're in the apocalypse. Maybe this is the end of everything. Because the world isn't going the way that we had thought it would go, Jesus. And some people think, you're on the forefront of the final days. That's what that means. You know what they're really saying? We have no idea. You, we can't put you in a box. Jesus, you're an enigma to us. 
You're just kind of like breaking all our expectations. And, and we see all this stuff happening. We hear everything that you're saying. We watch what you're doing. You're upending our world. We don't know. People are like, they're confused by you. You, Jesus, are an enigma to us. Sometimes you have to look at the clues in the story. Matthew's giving us a clue. Where did it happen? A place called Caesarea Philippi. They had to leave their nation. Jesus said, yeah, just go for a walk. Sure. It'd be like me saying, hey, let's go on a little trip, Nick. And we end up in Toronto. That's not a little trip. He literally left Israel, crossed the border to this city that is a metropolitan area. And what's really crazy, Caesarea Philippi, it's part of the name is devoted to the leader of their empire, Caesar. You know what happens in Caesarea Philippi? People worship the government. They really do. There are shrines to the worship of Caesar. Because in their day, it was kind of like, hey, worship whatever you want. Make sure you worship Caesar, too. It was a way of holding people in line, saying, you need to worship the government. You know what else was going on in Caesarea Philippi? It was a metropolitan place where, like, it was one of those places where the religions of the world showed up. You know what it's a lot like? It's a lot like America, right? I love how the Bible has this bridge into the 21st century. Come on, Americans worshiping the government. Right? When you think, when you put all your hope in the government to solve all the world's problems, that's a form of worship. And how many people in America put tremendous amounts of money and a tremendous amounts of time into politics in the hope that it's going to make the world better? It's kind of a worship. And we are a field of religions of which Christianity is an option. We're a lot like Caesarea Philippi. And so kind of what Matthew's done in this, you know, ever been to the theater? Have you been to the theater and they come out onto the stage? What's behind them? A backdrop. And the backdrop is supposed to give you sometimes a clue about what's going on in the story, right? The backdrop here is Jesus is standing against the worship of politics, against the worship and the religions of the world, and he's saying, guys, how do I compare? What do you think? What are people saying? And they're confused. Who do people say I am? It's an important question. It's one we're still exploring today. We hear people talk about Jesus all the time, right? What are they thinking about? He was like, a, he was like a, an unexpected revolutionary. He launched this, he didn't mean to, but he launched a, a whole world religion. He was a really nice person. He was kind to people. He cared about the poor. He's an inspiration to me to be more generous. It was Jesus. He's kind of like a, a holy man or a wise philosopher or a great religious teacher. And people just get carried away with some of the things they said. Who is he? He's a figurehead of a world religion. Right? Who is Jesus? He's the representative of my political party. Who is Jesus? An option. You know who Jesus really is to most Americans? This big, confusing enigma that hangs over their head and they don't know what to say and they just grab at straws to try to explain them. Right? Jesus is just a cloud that hangs over our nation or our world even in people's lives. And like, they don't really know how to answer the question. But he's there. So now Jesus is going to change the question a little bit. This is what Jesus does. People are talking, well, what do other people say? I don't know. What, is, what do people say? And then Jesus looks at me and says, what about you? This is the most important question in life. Who do you say I am? This is the most important question in your life. Because this question, this question impacts your calendar. This question impacts your bank statement. This question impacts your relationships. This question can impact how you feel when death comes close at your door. This question will touch how you feel when life is falling apart. This question will kind of carry you through the day. This question could, the answer to this question could bring joy, it could bring hope, it could bring confusion, it could bring confidence, it could bring comfort, it could bring frustration. Right? The answer to this question is the most important question you'll ask because the impact on your life is significant. How people answer this question, I have seen it change the atmosphere of a memorial service or funeral. 
this is the most important question you'll wrestle with. Somebody answers. Simon Peter. He's, I love Simon Peter. I'll, in a moment, I'm going to say, Simon Peter gives me hope, right? Simon Peter, he's the guy who like, speaks first and thinks second, right? That's the destiny of my life. I mean, that's been the description of my whole past, right? Simon Peter answers, you're the Messiah, the son of the living God. That's what I think. Now, let me tell you what he was saying, right? Because we're looking back in retrospect with what that means. But at the moment that Peter said that, Peter was like, you're the Messiah. And the Messiah to them was a significant political leader, someone who's going to bring hope. He's going to restore the glory days. He's going to free them from oppression and from all these heavy taxes. And he's going to lead them back, like their history talked about, in the days when their country was significant. And we had hope for who we were, and we were a national leader. And the Messiah is going to do that. Then he tags on to that, the son of the living God, which is a real profound statement. Because Peter could have been killed for that statement. What Peter is saying, because he means it, the son of the living God. What Peter's saying is like, you're a significant person who's going to change the world. There's a power about you, a presence about you that's just different. Man, when you speak, things happen. People will, are willing to follow you. You can make a difference, Jesus. You're someone that if you rise up, the world will follow you. And I think the world will change because there's a power and a presence in your life that has a divine inspira- nature to it. I don't fully understand it. But this has been my experience of you, Jesus. And I love this because Jesus then says, well, blessed are you, Simon, son of John, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. He was like, he's like, good job, man. He's looking at Peter and he's like, good job, man. That statement's going to carry you far. And there's a piece of that that only God could tell you. Now, why this gives me hope is because Peter has no idea what he's saying. Right? Really, he's, it's kind of like, you know, a kid who comes back and, uh, or, you know, they're anticipating this great trip and they're all excited about it. They have no idea how excited they're going to be when they get there, right? Or, you know, you get married, you have no idea what this, what this moment's going to mean, but you're willing to say, I do, Right? And Peter at this moment in life, he's like, this is, how, this is what I believe. And Jesus accepts it. Because Jesus accepts us where we are with a confession that has a commitment to it. And Peter's just saying, look, here's my confession. You're the Messiah. What I believe of him. And I really believe you're the son of the living God. And Jesus is like, okay, I'll take that. We can work with that. Because Peter, we're going to unpackage that. And when we unpackage it, you're going to look at me and like, wow, I never knew that's what it meant. But I'm willing to start here with you, Jesus. I love Peter, because Peter's awesome. Peter's the type of guy that jumps out of a boat in the middle of the storm because he sees Jesus walking on water and then get freaks out by the wave and starts to drown. Peter's the guy that in the midst of trouble says, Jesus, I'll never abandon you. And then denies Jesus the last, you know, during the, the whole court scene. And he's the guy that gets challenged by Jesus, says, I'm really sorry. And Jesus accepts his apology. And then Peter, at the very end of his life, says, I'll die for my faith and does. He's all over the place. But Jesus accepts him. And he accepts what this is. This is called a confession. A confession is a stepping stone in your journey with Jesus Christ. Who do you say I am? It doesn't mean like you can say anything you want. But it starts here. You're the Messiah, the son of the living God. It's like getting married. Right? Marriage ceremonies have a confession. We ask people, you know, about it, and they say, I do. Right? We give them, we give them the commitment, we st- and, they, and we say, I do. And you know what I think with every wedding that i ever done, when they say I do, especially young men and women, and we're staying there, I always think you have no idea what you just committed to. <laughs> right? Right? But they're in it. They're in it. I love this person. Yeah, I know. But you haven't woken up next to him. And, you know, so yeah. I love this person. I know. But you haven't had a discussion about money yet. Right? Or I love this person. I know. But you haven't had kids yet. Right? <laughs> It's a commitment you're willing to make based on what you know about the person despite the changes you're going to experience in the future. And you know, it's, you know what? You know it's going to get hard. You know it's going to be great. But you're willing to stay the course 
And as time progresses, that commitment grows in your understanding and its impact on your life. It's similar to this. Peter's making a confession about Jesus publicly that he's, being, that he's willing to be held accountable to. It's a stepping stone in your faith. How did Peter ever come to that decision? <laughs> right? Well, Jesus told him. A bit of it's revelation. You know what? You just experienced God and it built a conviction inside your heart. We talk about that all the time here. You know how you get that? You pray. God, just help me to understand in this journey. Show me who Jesus is. That's a great prayer. I'm willing to explore it. Show me who Jesus is. And God brings illumination. He brings revelation. He helps you to understand that. He, he, Peter got it from experience. He walked around and saw Jesus in action. He saw him feeding people. He saw him terrorizing demons, like I was saying. Like, he's, like I said, he saw him walk on water. He saw Jesus in compassion, help people and get criticized for it. He heard Jesus speak. He put himself in a place where Jesus was doing work, and he began to discover who Jesus really was. And we do that here with ministry teams. I say all the time, I don't care where you are on your journey of Jesus Christ. I don't care if you say, I'm not a Christian. I can find a place for you to serve here. Because if you put yourself in that place where you can see God working through other people, even if you don't share it, I have seen people time and time again say, my view of Jesus Christ changed. It's your experience in him. In community. G Peter was walking with a group of other disciples, right? With, there's 12 of them, but there are more. And well, you know what we don't get, which I wish we had, was the fireside chats. They went on long journeys, which means they slept in the wilderness. If you've ever been camping, how much just unfolds around a campfire? A lot, right? Your heart opens up and things get deep and you start to talk about things. I wish we had recordings of those moments. But Peter had that. He lived in community with people in this journey with Jesus Christ as he was exploring what it meant to follow Jesus Christ. He had opportunity to ask questions, to hear answers, to get challenged, to poke, and it brought him to this place of confession. We do this here. We call them faith groups. We've got an awesome one called Starting Point that in this journey of Jesus Christ, you can join Starting Point. You can poke with questions. You can ask whatever you want. It's a safe place to open up your heart, and you can challenge the things that are said. Or you just want to join a faith group, a small group of people where you can ask those hard questions and somebody will just listen and guide you. It brings you to a place of revelation. You get it by the Bible. You think Jesus was teaching from. We call it scriptures. It was what we call the Old Testament. Jesus would open up. He would unfold it. He would teach people. They got to hear that. Peter was listening to Jesus teach from the scriptures and from the Bible, and it contributed to this moment. That's where we get the phrase Messiah from. Son of the living God. When you put all these elements together, it brought him to that place of confession. So I say to people, don't explore Jesus Christ on your own. Reach out to God and pray. Join into a ministry team and get some experience. Become part of a small group here. We get the opportunity of community to answer that question. Read the Bible with other people's help. That's how Peter came to this place of discovery. You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. It's one of the things that's a little scary about America right now. The pandemic has cost churches. Because people in the last two years, your patterns were broken. And I'm watching you on TV, right? Your patterns were broken. Your, your, the way you spend your time has changed. And so you kind of drifted away. Who do you say Jesus is? How has the experiences of the last two years affected you? Because you drifted from this. You drifted from praying. You drifted from serving. You drifted from faith group. You drifted from your Bible readings. And now you're wrestling with the question all over again. Jesus says something. This is, continues to encourage me. So Jesus turns to Peter and he says, and I'll tell you that you are Peter and on this rock I'll build my church. There have been books written about this little statement. I'm going to tell you what I think it means. Okay. I think it means two things. I think it means what Peter said. His confession. On this rock, I will build my church. Because what is that confession about? Jesus Christ is the Messiah. He is greater than a political leader. 
He is the leader who has come with the authority around the world to bring change to the world. He has come to lead into the world the kingdom of God. He is the Messiah for the world. And he's the son of the living God. That's the seed of the church. That confession, that realization, that has changed the world. Not Peter. The confession has changed the world. Because the confession is about the person who's at the core of the church. Without Jesus Christ, it'd be no church. But because he is the Messiah, because he is the son of the living God, it is the rock to the church. It's the cornerstone to the church. In Peter, the other thing I think is, is wrapped in this, is Peter is a representative of a group of people called disciples. People, you see this word in the story, right? And it means a student. They were studying under Jesus. Afterwards, in the book of Acts, which comes at the end of the four Gospels, they're called apostles, messengers. The whole group is. And Peter's one of a group of people. There's even a, a council in Jerusalem and making significant decisions about the beliefs and practices of being a Christian, and Peter is a part of that group. He's actually held accountable to them. He has to explain his actions. When he goes off the rails, other apostles pull him back on the rails. He does tremendous things, but he's part of a group of people. And I think that Jesus is saying, this confession and the people that you represent, the future leaders of the church, you are the foundation you're part of the rock to the church, Peter. Which ironically is what Peter means, right? But I don't think he was talking about just the person. Because Peter is way unstable. He's all over the place, right? Collectively, the group of people who own that confession, Jesus is saying, on this, I'll build my church. And here's a crazy thing. This is the first time that word is used in, Ma in Matthew's gospel, church. Jesus is saying something significant now. And this is another reason why I think it's greater than just Peter. Because on this I'll build, on this rock I'll build my church. And listen to how he describes the church. The gate of Haiti will not overcome it. That's a euphemism. There's your word. Kids, this is justifies why you had to get up early and come to church. Because we just we're using the word euphemism. Right? What it means is, is this phrase, the gate of Haiti was kind of a, a phrase that was used for something else. And in the Bible, it's used for death. Death won't conquer the church. You know why? Because Jesus Christ is the core of the church, and he conquered death. In 2,000 years, the church has not died out. You know, there was a tremendous thing. If you're into history, in the last century, when the Soviet Union was constructed, they really felt that in a socialist government, they could take away the need for church. They felt so that when it didn't go away, they started to add persecution and strict government restrictions. They just felt the church would die out. Well, guess what? It didn't. The Soviet Union fell apart, but the church existed. And on every continent where the church is represented, there have been governments that have persecuted it, tried to eliminate it, have pressed against it, have tried to educate people out of it, have tried to um, create laws against it, and the church doesn't die. When you make that confession, that confession is a commitment that makes you part of a church that is stronger than death. Because not only has the church not died out, but you won't die out. And I get it. You're like, whoa, I've been to plenty of funerals and memorial services. Yes, you have. But the promise is, is that your spirit, when you die, is with Jesus Christ. You won't die out. There's a theory in science that, you know, energy is not wasted. So when you die, your energy dissipates into the universe. What Christians say is your energy, which is your soul, is with Jesus Christ, and you are you with Jesus. You don't die out. This confession is built on the rock of Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And then Jesus went on to say, I, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Now, this next phrase, this is a quote from another book in the Bible called Isaiah. It's used to describe the power of a prime minister. Think of it like a diplomat in America, right? 
I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth, this is the phrase, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. And they've made this phrase. It meant to describe the power of a diplomat who represented their country. You got the keys and you got the authority. And what he's saying to Peter is, that church is going to be my body on earth. That church is going to carry my authority. This church can be confident that it will survive death. This church is stronger than anything that will oppose it. And then Jesus Christ proved it because when he died, what did we say last week happened? He came back to life. And the church is stronger than death. The church is stronger than the government. The church is stronger than any oppression because the church is founded on Jesus Christ. And he's saying when you make a confession, that is a commitment that makes you part of the church. You don't have to worry about anything. You know what the world needs right now? A confident church. Not a church that's afraid of the political chaos in our world. Not a church that's unended by social unrest. Not a church that's running in fear. Of the, is it the apocalypse because of the war? A church who enters all of that and says we are the church because Jesus Christ is the Messiah, the son of the living God. It has the power to overcome death and you can be a part of it. And why are you going to let this world scare you? Why will you let it take away your confidence? Your confession, which is a public commitment, makes you part of an enduring reality, the church, which is more powerful than death. How's that? Amen. Is that good? Is that good, Cappy? Is that good? So, how are you going to answer that question? The way you answer that question will change your life. The way that you answer that question at some point in your life needs to be a public statement. Not a private thing, not a little holy huddle thing, but a public thing. That's why we do baptisms. That's why I love that we brought, we're able to bring baptisms into worship. It's when you make a statement in front of a group of people and you say, hold me accountable to it. And it's okay. You don't have to have all the questions answered. You don't have to have all the doubts resolved. You know, it's okay if you're a little nervous and scared about that commitment. Because I'm telling you, every single person who made that commitment 10 years later said, I had no idea what I was saying. But it was, the journey has been so cool. I made that public declaration of faith at my baptism when I was 14 in the middle of a church service. I had no idea what I was talking about. But I knew at that moment, I knew at that moment that Jesus was the Son of God. I knew at that moment I was not going to solve my own problems. I knew at that moment that the world was bigger than me and I needed Jesus Christ. And I had this like little fledgling conviction that Jesus was bigger than all those problems, that Jesus was going to solve my death, and that I could cling on to him and my life was going to get better. And that's where it started. And look at where it's become. Because I didn't give it up. I made a public commitment. I wrestled with it. I argued over it. At times I walked away from it. There were moments when I drifted from it. There were moments when I drifted from it when I was in ministry. I have stood up to the challenges. I have fallen on my face with those challenges. I have wrestled through my doubts. But I made that public commitment, and Jesus Christ took it and said, good enough for me. How are you going to answer that question? It's time for us to wrestle with that question because we are coming out of a pandemic into a world that's a mess. How will you answer that question? God, I want to pray. This is the first stone in the pathway. And I know that you're challenging us. I know that you're looking at Christians in America. I know that you're looking at people, Lord, who are lost, Lord, in fear and confusion and anger and doubt, Lord, and they don't know what to do. And you're crying out to them, who do you say that I am? So, Lord, I'm praying that today and through the rest of this series that your spirit will speak and press on our hearts, Lord, that you'll convict us and release us from these things that are weighing us down and that you'll restore and give us a confidence, Lord. A strength that comes with that, com with that confession. Jesus, please, break upon our hearts, our minds, our souls with this question. Who do you say that I am? Give us an answer, Lord. Amen.